As Brother Monty mentioned, it's good to see you today, and it's great to be together in the house of the Lord. We have a really good crowd today. Uh, we have some visitors with us today, and uh, we want you to know if you consider yourself a visitor, we're glad that you're here, and we uh, want you also to know that you're our honored guest, and we hope that what you find here this morning will be uplifting to you, that it will help you grow closer to God. That is our goal. We want to help each other get to heaven, and that's... One of the blessings, the great blessings that God gave us by putting us in a body of believers is we assist each other, we encourage each other, and we spur one another on to the obedience of Christ. I appreciate the reading this morning. Uh, if you felt like you were having a little bit of deja vu, that wasn't Caleb's fault, that was my fault for having verse 13 on there twice. Sorry about that. Uh, but this reading that we read this morning, just to revisit for a moment, the idea here is that every single part of God's body is a very vital and important part of God's purpose. And every part does its share in doing what? Notice, every part does its share in causing growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. You might say that, a, that the body is self-sustaining in some ways and that when it is working because of the effectiveness of God's design and and, and because of the power of Jesus Christ, that the body itself grows by itself when every part is doing its share. And if you also notice, some of the parts of this body are mentioned in verse 11 when he talks about apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And their role is to equip the saints for the work that God has given to them. Notice again, for the edifying of the body. And so what we're going to do, Lord willing, this month is we're going to talk about these various roles. And we're going to talk about evangelists today. And then, Lord willing, Brother John will talk to us about deacons. And then on the third Sunday, Brother Jim Hayes will be here to talk to us about the role of elders in, in the body of Christ. And then uh, on the fourth Sunday, we'll be talking about the saints. And so if, if that gives you an idea of where we're going this morning, this isn't just some random topic uh, where we decided to just talk about evangelists today. Now, uh, those of you who do know me know that I, I do the work of an evangelist. Those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm going to speak in third person today because I don't want to talk about myself. Uh, and, and it's not really going to be my explanation necessarily of the role or the work or the duties of an evangelist. But I think it's important that we, when we talk about evangelists that we disabuse ourselves from any preconceived notions that we might have because of how the world uses the term evangelist and just look at the Bible. And so I, I hope that we can do that and I hope that I objectively convey that this morning as we look at the scriptures and we view what is God's role for an evangelist. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 5, Paul said, But you, be watchful, in all things endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. So Paul, as he writes to this young evangelist, Timothy, he admonishes him to do the work of an evangelist. Now, maybe you've heard somebody say, we're all evangelists. Okay, well, in the generic sense of what the word means, yes, we're all to be evangelizing. We're all to be, uh, in some way, shining forth the glory of God's salvation through Jesus Christ. So in that way, we're all evangelizing. But as the Bible uses the term evangelist, we're not all evangelists in the sense of what Paul was talking about in Ephesians 4 and also in 2 Timothy 4. And if you notice, this word is not used a lot in Scripture. It's used three times. And so in those three times, it is referring to the specific role or office, we might say, of evangelists within the body. Now, this root word, 2097, is the word that's translated gospel. And so you just see in the root word that evangelist work is all about what? The gospel. A gospel messenger, a gospel preacher. And there's even another word in between these, which would be in your Strong's G2098, which just means preach or preacher. And so you get those two ideas together. An evangelist is a <laughs> preacher of the gospel. Okay, let's now, let's just go home, right? Well, actually, the Bible has a lot to say, even though the word is only used three times. The Bible has a lot to say about evangelists, and we'll talk about that more in just a moment. So, again, I want us to disabuse ourselves of maybe some of the worldly usages of this term. Evangelist is not the same as a televangelist. And when people ask me what I do and I say evangelist, they say, so, 
oh, like Jimmy Swaggart or, you know, Billy Graham or that's not at all what I do. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying it would be wrong for someone to evangelize on television. That's not the point. I'm just saying as our modern usage and how the Bible uses that term, someone who just gets on TV and preaches the gospel, that's not necessarily an evangelist. An evangelist is also not a pastor. Uh, if you notice in Ephesians 4, there was a distinction between those two roles, but a lot of times that's, those words are used interchangeably in the world, but the Bible uses them distinctly, and they're two different roles. When we say pastor, when the Bible uses the term pastor, which that word just means shepherd, it is referring to an elder or a bishop. Those are all different words used for the same office, and Brother Jim, Lord willing, will talk about that the third Sunday of the month. An evangelist is also not a pulpit minister, and, and I would challenge you to go home. Um, obviously, it would take a while to scan the entire New Testament, but look all through the New Testament, do a word search. The, the term pulpit minister is not in the Bible. It's just not in the Bible. Uh, now, is there a ministry of pulpiting, if you will? Yes, there's a ministry there. There's a service that people do by teaching from what we call the pulpit and obviously this is sort of a hybrid but but there is a ministry of preaching well he talked about that too in Ephesians 4 when he said teachers but there's not a pulpit minister that is one person who does all the pulpit teaching in a congregation you don't see that in the Bible we see a multiplicity of people men teaching within these uh, congregations and so I just want to make those distinctions, but evangelist is very different. And again, there are distinctions made by Paul himself. Now, apostles and prophets are not existing offices today within the church. They were an office that had its own set of qualifications. Apostles were literally eyewitnesses of Jesus' resurrection. They saw the resurrected Jesus. And that was a, a, a part of their being an ambassador of Christ not just an ambassador as being a delegate or a representative of Jesus, but an ambassador that had been an eyewitness of the resurrected Jesus. That was apostles, and they had a different role, although sometimes similar to an evangelist, which we'll talk about later. Uh, prophets is another role that, that is not existing today in the miraculous sense of someone being given the Spirit of God in order to predict the future or be given inspiration to reveal a message to God's people. What we have today are the words of the apostles and prophets, and we don't have time to study this this morning, but all throughout the New Testament. And so they revealed God's will to us, the apostles and prophets did, and what we have now is known as the inspired word of God. So is an evangelist required to move around from church to church? And this is a common idea uh, that evangelists, they can't live in one place for very long. They've got to be moving, sort of like what we see in the military, you know, going from this base to this base and stationed here and stationed here. Well, uh, I would say this, biblically speaking, one size doesn't fit all. So if we're going to ask that question, is an evangelist required to just move around from church to church to church? We see different things in the New Testament about different people. So... Acts 19, 22. We're going to go through these really quickly, by the way. I just want you to notice the different places where Timothy worked. His work was not limited to one congregation. He wasn't the pastor over one church. He wasn't a pulpit minister in one church. But notice, he sent to, into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus. That's the same Timothy, the young evangelist. Acts uh, 1 Thessalonians 3 and 2, and sent Timothy, our brother, a minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ. And we'll come back to this passage later. But Timothy also worked in Thessalonica, which was a region in Macedonia. Now, Philippi also was a place where Timothy worked, but I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly. So Timothy didn't stay in Thessalonica. He also went to Philippi, but he also worked in Corinth. For this reason, I've sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son. First Timothy chapter 1 verse 3, here Paul speaking to Timothy says, as I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus. And don't get the wrong idea that he's saying you can't ever leave Ephesus. No, he's just saying I left you there when I left so you could continue this work that we were both doing when we were both there. But again, Timothy worked also in Ephesus. Now, these places are a geologically speaking Geographic, not geologically, geographically speaking, these places were hundreds of miles apart. And so Timothy, he's tracking in a lot of places. He's working with a lot of different churches. He's not just uh, pulpited, if you will, in one church. 
And he's not the pastor over one church. And he's not a bishop in the sense of how the world uses that, that he is ruling over all these churches either. But he's working with multiple churches. Now that's Timothy. Now what about Titus? Titus is also an evangelist. And we see with Titus, he says, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. Now if you're not familiar with Crete, Crete is not a city. It is an island with multiple cities. And notice he says, I want you to work in Crete and ordain elders where? In one church? In one congregation? No, in every city. So you see that Titus' the scope of his work was broad. It wasn't just in one congregation of the Lord's church, but it was in multiple congregations of the Lord's church. Then we have Philip. And if you remember Philip, Philip is in Acts chapter 6. He's one of the seven that had his, the, uh, the apostles laid their hands on him, and they ordained him to uh, oversee tables in distributing beneficiary uh, benevolence rather to widows. And, but what else did he do? Well, he preached the gospel. And we, if you go back in Acts chapter 8 early, he went to Samaria, and he preached the gospel in Samaria. And then later, God calls him to go down on the, what we call the Gaza Strip and preach to an Ethiopian eunuch. And then after that happens, he's caught away by an angel and it says Philip was found in Azotus. And passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Now, why, why does Luke say Philip passed through all the cities preaching the gospel till he came to Caesarea? What did he mean by that? He means he didn't continue through cities after that. In fact, we... Fast forward way ahead to Acts chapter 21, and it says, And on the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to where? Caesarea. Okay, so he came to Caesarea. This is Acts 21. On the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed, came to Caesarea, and entered the house of who? Philip the evangelist, who was one of the seven. So we know it was the same Philip from Acts chapter 8. Now, why do I bring this up? Because between Acts 8, where Paul is not even a convert, and he's persecuting the church in Acts 21, there's at least, we know there's at least 15 years. Some estimate that it could have been 25 or 30 years. And here's my point. Philip moves to Caesarea, has a house in Caesarea. He's not moving his family here and there and here and there all the time. That's not required. Why? Because one size doesn't fit all. Timothy, the scope of Timothy's work, may have been very different from the work of Philip. Caesarea was a big city and Philip's working in that city and he's still laboring in the gospel and the Bible refers to him as an evangelist, but he's doing the work of an evangelist. So going back to this passage, notice this also, do the work of an evangelist fulfill your ministry, he says. Now, another word that's used, uh, that's I guess sort of been changed over time is the word ministry. That word just means service. And so when we see the word minister in the Bible, it doesn't mean minister in the generic sense of how the world uses that. It just means servant. And so servant is what's, service is what's referred to here. Fulfill your service as what? As an evangelist. Do that work. So in the King James, it translates this, make full proof of your ministry. And in the New King James that we just read, fulfill your ministry. Now, that sounds very different and maybe... Maybe it is if, if you look at the way that's translated, but think about this. Carry out fully, if you notice the definition, in evidence. And so in one sense, Paul is saying, uh, is saying there needs to be proof of the service you're doing, but also full proof. In other words, fulfill your ministry and there's evidence of the work that you're doing in your service as an evangelist. So work to entirely accomplish your service as an evangelist. So we're going to spend the rest of our time talking about that because here's something that, that we don't need to throw out is that everybody has a ministry. Everybody. If you're a member of God's body, you've got a ministry. And that means you have some type of service that God wants for you to do as an individual, whether, whether you're an elder, a deacon, uh, an evangelist, or a saint. God has a ministry for you. But the things addressed in 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and in Titus are not generic teachings. They're teachings written to evangelists about their specific ministry. And they're unique in that way. We have very few letters written to individuals in the New Testament. One of those is Philemon, which we don't know that he was an officer in the church, but he was certainly a fellow laborer with Paul and also with Timothy. 
But these three letters are written about the specific role of evangelist work. And there's 13 chapters written about the work of an evangelist. Now, you may think, well, that's not very much. That's actually more written to the work of an evangelist than is written to any church except for Rome and Corinth. So think about that. This is an important role within God's body that he had a lot to say about. And Paul wrote to both of these evangelists, Timothy and Titus. Now, there are general principles taught in these letters. So don't think that, well, I don't even need to read 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy and Titus because those are about evangelists and I'm not an evangelist. There are general principles written in those letters. It's just that the commands and charges are specifically toward the evangelist. And we, I wish we had time to look in all those, but we don't. We're going to cover a ton of, of material in a short time. 1 Timothy chapter 4, 15, meditate on these things. He says, give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. So Paul says, here's the things that I've written to you. Here's what I want you to give yourself entirely to. Now, when you hear those two words together, give yourself entirely to, what, what, what does your mind go to? You ever seen somebody that was, let's use the word, obsessed with something? Like it was the singular focus of their whole world. That's what Timothy is being told here. Give yourself entirely to do what? To work in the realm and service that God has called you to work. This needs to be the apple of your eye. It needs to be what all of your labor and your work is toward. And if you do that, your progress will be made evident to all. Everybody will see the growth in you, Timothy, as an individual if you'll give yourself entirely to them. And what were those things? He said, till I come, give attendant to reading, to doctrine, to exhortation. And then he says, meditate on these things. That is the scope, the focus of an evangelist's work, the Word of God. It is the sword that he wields as he goes about laboring and warring in the body of Christ. It is the Word of God. So, are we going to conclude then that evangelist is just a traveling preacher? That's usually how the word is used. Now... Obviously, we see evangelists traveling and preaching, right? Because he's a minister of the gospel of Christ. And we know people can't be saved without the preaching of the gospel of Christ. So it is important that people travel, that they preach the gospel. We've got people right now that are overseas doing that very thing. They went 9,000 miles to go preach the gospel. Now, is that what an evangelist does? Well, actually, there's other things that an evangelist does other than just preaching the gospel. Titus chapter 1, verse 5 that we read earlier, for this reason... He says, I left you in Crete that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. It wasn't just Titus' role to go into Crete and preach the gospel. He says, I left you there so you could set in order the things that are lacking. Now, maybe some of you have broken a bone and have had to have that bone set. How's that feel? That is painful, isn't it? But what happens if you don't get the bone set rightly? You can ask my son about that later. He's got a bone that was broken when he was a kid that wasn't ever set rightly, and his arms kind of messed up, right? And that's what happens if you don't set something correctly. Well, it's out of joint. It's not straight. And that's really what the word set in order means. It means to set in order besides or further or to straighten further or arrange additionally. So, so Titus's role in Crete was to do what? To help arrange things, to help set things in their proper order, we might say, to make sure things were according to God's design. See, God has a blueprint for His churches, for His congregations, and it was Titus's job to go in and make sure that all those things were being fulfilled. That a church goes from an infant state to a state of full maturity, wherein it's operating just as God has designed and functioned. And so what we see in the early New Testament was these churches, they were babies. They were in an infant state. They... They, did, they hadn't been existing for generations and generations like this congregation where we've had generations of elders come and go. And we've had uh, people who have lived and served and they built a foundation for us. And we're sort of living off of that training that they gave. That wasn't Crete and that wasn't these early churches. And so the role was very important to go in and ordain elders and ensure that these churches came to a state of maturity. Now... Uh, maybe you've heard this before, and, and this is something that has been said to help distinguish between the work of an elder and the work of an evangelist. Uh, elders is all about management, and evangelist is all about sales. And that seems like a very 
simple way to define that. However, if you think about what's said here, set in order the things that are lacking, that's more management than it is sales, right? That's more management than sales. Now, here's part of the issue. is God has uh, designed that churches would be overseen by a plurality of elders or pastors or bishops, whatever word you want to use, and that they're guiding the congregation, residing over the congregation, but 70% of the congregations that I work with, out of about 166, 70% of those churches don't have elders. They don't have elders. So what was God's design? Well, we see that in the New Testament, that evangelists would help those churches to mature and grow so that they can have elders. And I don't know if you know this or not, but that's not a speedy process. If you go look at the list of qualifications for bishops and elders in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, you don't just go in for a week and all of a sudden you've got a bunch of men who meet those qualifications. Sometimes that takes years. Sometimes it takes decades to have mature men who can serve in those roles and those offices. So the work is great, friends. The work is great. But this is God's purpose and His design. And so this is the role. Now, what we do see is that the evangelist's work in the first century was very similar to Paul's. Now, don't misunderstand me. An evangelist is not an apostle. An evangelist didn't have the authority of an apostle. They're very different. But the work they were doing in churches was very similar. Notice, and if Timothy comes, see that he may be with you without fear, for he does the work of the Lord, as I also do. So Paul puts Timothy in a similar category to doing the same type of work that he was doing. Notice Philippians chapter 1 and verse 1. He says, Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and the deacons. Notice there's three roles mentioned, or four, four of, the, of the five here. Paul and Timothy. Who's Paul? An apostle. Who's Timothy? He's an evangelist. To who? To the saints. With who? The bishops and the deacons. I said four. There's five. So the only thing that's not mentioned here is prophets, right? Where was this at? This was the church in Philippi. And notice that Paul and Timothy called he, uh, uh, Paul called he and Timothy, himself and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ. That's a kind of weird phraseology, isn't it? We don't tell people we're bond servants of Jesus Christ, do we? Well, maybe we do. What's that mean? We're bound to Jesus Christ to follow Him as our Master and do this work or this ministry. Now, notice what he said later in this letter. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. Now, why are we reading this? Because in verse 1, we establish something about Philippi. They're a mature church. They have elders and they have deacons. But yet Paul still felt it necessary to send Timothy to them so he could find out how they're doing. So what do you think Timothy did? When it went, how y'all doing? What did Paul do when he did this same work? Because we actually see the example of Paul and Barnabas and Silas and, and, and John Mark also going into churches and doing this same thing. Notice Acts 15, 36. And some days after Paul said to Barnabas, let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. So here again, we're going to go see how things are. We're going to go see their state. Now, what did he do? If we go down just a few verses later, we find exactly what happened. They circled back and they went through these churches that they'd established. And it says he went through Syria and Cilicia confirming the churches. He said, let's go see how they are. What they do? They went through and they confirmed the churches. What's the word confirm mean? It means to establish beside, to strengthen more, to support further, to reestablish, or to confirm. Very similar to the same words we saw earlier in Titus chapter 1, to set in order. So, so this was the work they were doing. Why is this happening? Why is this happening? Because sometimes churches get sick. Did you know that? Sometimes churches get sick. Sometimes they're not functioning the way they need to function. Sometimes nobody's there for what we might call quality control or management to say, hey, look, this isn't happening and this is according to God's design. So whose role is it? That's where the evangelists came and, and they went to these churches and they helped these churches to not only know their state, it wasn't just about Paul knowing their state, but them knowing their state. 
And that's why most of these letters that we see are written in the New Testament is Paul saying, this is your state. This is where God wants you. Do better. You know what that is? Setting in order. Setting straight. Establishing. And again, that could be uncomfortable. 1 Thessalonians 3, 2, And sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, listen, to establish you and encourage you concerning the faith. So here we see Timothy as an evangelist doing the same work that Paul and Barnabas and Silas did in going to the churches to help them in their state to ensure that they were coming toward maturity. We see the same thing with Titus. And he says this of Titus, as for Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker. Listen, for your benefit. And as for our brothers, they are messengers of the churches, the glory of Christ. The role of an evangelist is for who? Their work is all about the saints and all about the world. That's a pretty big area, isn't it? See, uh, the, the evangelist is not just to be preaching the gospel to the lost, but his work is also about those that are in the body, those that are saved. And we're going to see that as we continue with our study this morning. So what authority, if any, does an evangelist have? And where does an evangelist get their authority? You know, that's something I never knew growing up as a kid. I, we had evangelists come in here all the time, and, and I didn't know how they got that authority or, or how they were trained. And I wish we had time to go into the training of evangelists. We simply don't have time to do that. Uh, but I will say, if you look through the book of Acts, you're going to see exactly how Timothy and Titus were trained. They were trained by Paul. What they do? They went with him. He showed them what to do. He wrote them these letters and instructed them and said, here's your work, and here's what you do, and here's how you behave yourself, and here's... What you need to do. So one of the things that we see in 1 Timothy chapter 4 is Paul writes to Timothy, says, Do not neglect the gift that is in you which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Now, if, if you're a King James person, that word is presbytery. And again, same word uh, or same idea, presbyter, elder, bishop, pastor, same roles. We had elders laying their hands on evangelists and sending them out. And again, I wish we had time to go into this in further detail but you actually see that in the book of Acts. And the idea of appointing or ordaining an, an evangelist is very similar to sending them out. And there was actually a time when the Holy Ghost came and said, Okay, Paul and Barnabas have been there for long enough. i got work for them to do. Send them out. And so they laid their hands on them. They sent them out to go do that work. They were commissioned, if you will. And that's why Paul even talks about it in Romans chapter 16. And he says, For how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of, of Christ. But he says... How will they preach unless they be sent? So we've got to find people. We've got to find men that are, that are equipped with this and send them out so they can go and they can preach the gospel. And the elders gave them that authority. So, this is interesting. Elders ordain evangelists. Evangelists ordain elders. And that may be a chicken and egg question for you. And if you want to answer that, the apostles came first. <laughs> So there, there wasn't an evangelist that just jumped on the scene. There wasn't an elder that just jumped on the scene. I, I think it's a breaker issue. But what we do see is that apostles, they started that process. And then there were elders ordained and there were evangelists ordained by the apostles. And that process began. And, and since then, the same thing's been happening. Elders ordain evangelists, evangelists ordain elders. And so there's accountability in that. That's my point. There's accountability. Uh, evangelists do not have authority to run around and make decisions and do things without any type of accountability. That is not profitable for the kingdom of God. It's not profitable for the kingdom of God for elders to run around and do whatever they want without accountability. And here's what we're going to see is that those two, those two offices, while different, they work in tandem and in correlation with one another for the saints and for the good of the saints and for the edifying of the body of Christ. So another thing that, that evangelists do, as we saw in Ephesians 4, is they equip saints for the work of the ministry. And we're not going to read that. Once again, I just want to refer back to it. What I do want to see is specifically in the letter that was written to Timothy, he makes note that a part of that equipping would be training other teachers. Notice, and the things which you've heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. See, Paul didn't tell Timothy, I want you to go to these churches and I want you to be their pulpit minister. I want you to be their preacher. 
That's not what he said. He said, I want you to go to these churches and I want you to find faithful men and I want you to teach them so they can teach others also. Who did he say to find? You know what he didn't say? I want you to go find the most educated men so that they will teach others also. That's not what he said at all. I'll tell you, you can have an educated man that's not faithful and what you got is you got a wolf. That's what you got. You got danger coming. It's not about education. The, the equipping of an evangelist is from the Word of God. It's not from some secular university somewhere that's come up with some training program. But again, it's 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. That's the training ground for an evangelist to learn his work and his role. And this is part of their work is to train others to teach. You know what else he didn't say? He didn't say go find the best public speakers. He said find faithful men. And I will tell you, if you find devoted men, faithful men to Jesus Christ, and you show them how to teach, they'll teach. And they'll teach the truth because they love God. Not because it's about ego or about their prestige or their glory. Because God's ways are not our ways, and our ways are not God's ways. But he said, find faithful men. And you train them so they can teach. This is another thing that Paul talks to Timothy about, about rebuking an elder who is sinning. He said, do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. Those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all, that the rest also may fear. I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing with partiality. Now, have you ever seen this happen? Anybody ever seen this happen? You ever seen an elder rebuked in the presence of the congregation? I have. Seen it in the Bible. Paul talks about it in Galatians, where he withstood Peter to the face because he was to be blamed because he had divided the church there in Antioch. And, and he, he didn't do it the way we would think to do it. it you know, we, we would think, well, let's take this person aside and let's have a quiet conversation. He said, I withstood him be, uh, to the face before them all. I said to him before them all, why did he do that? This is Peter. Come on, man. You can't do that to Peter. You can't call him out like that. Actually, notice what he says again in verse 21. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, the elect angels, that you observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing with partiality. It doesn't matter that it was Peter. He said, don't you be partial in this. Sin is sin, and sin needs to be called out. Now, how many times have we seen this happen? You know what we call this? The nuclear option. And I'll tell you, people accuse elders of things all the time. And I will just say, as an evangelist, do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. You know what he's saying? Verify. Verify. We've seen in our numbers study what happens when God's people rebel against the leadership he's ordained, haven't we? We saw that. Listen, elders of the church are ordained by God's word. You know what that means? Unless they're violating God's word, they're not in need of our rebuke, of our complaints, of our criticism, of our scrutiny. But he says if they're sinning and they're practicing sin, and that's been verified by multiple witnesses, then you rebuke them so that others may fear. Because it's not about them and it's not about you. This is about God's will. I'm glad that doesn't happen. <laughs> I'm glad that doesn't happen. But do you see the accountability? You know what? If an evangelist needs to be set straight by an, by an elder, that needs to happen. We're accountable to one another within this body. And God did not give anybody authority to just run around and do what they wanted to and use judgment that is contrary to God's word. So there is authority, but it's limited authority. Notice what he says. These things command and teach. You know what he didn't say to Timothy? You go in there like the new sheriff has rode into town and you set these people straight. No, he said, I've given you the list of things that are the will of God and those are the things that you command. You tell them what God said, what God's will is. Evangelists don't get to come in and, and make policy for churches. They don't get to use judgment in order to... Uh, set congregations fitting toward their preferences. They're messengers of the word of God. These things command, he says, 
that they may be blameless. 1 Timothy 6, 17, Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Go in there, Timothy. You work with these churches and you command them. Why? Because this is the will of God. Where is his authority? In the word of God. He's not the boss. He's not a ruler. He's not a lord. But he's to preach the word with authority. Titus chapter 2, But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. Now, we're not, we can't go through verses 2 through 14. That'll be later at some point. But he says, speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. Let no one despise you, Titus. You go in and you speak the truth. You say the truth. You know what? Sometimes that's hard. That's hard to say the truth. The truth is hard. But that's the role. That's the job. Remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. This is another thing that Paul tells this young evangelist, Timothy. He said, I want you to remind them of these things that I've told you, and I want you to charge them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit to the ruin of the hearers. So this is something that was right on his radar. He said, you tell them not to be fighting or quarreling about these things that are to no profit. Well, what's he mean, words to no profit? Well, look at verse 16. Shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. You know what that means? Profane and idle babblings, worldly and fruitless discussions. I'll tell you, I've seen God's people divide over some, I'm sorry, some stupid things. Dividing over politics. Do you think Jesus took our stripes so we could divide over politics? That's fruitless. And it leads to more ungodliness. God's people divide over sports. Over sports, over cars, over business. What's he say? You, you charge people. You stay out of that. Don't fight over things that are to no profit. You want to take a stand, take a stand on the doctrine. Take a stand on what unites us. Not on these fickle little worldly and carnal things that divide God's people. He said, you take a stand, Timothy. You remind them and you charge them. Timothy, protect what's been entrusted to you, avoiding worldly, empty chatter and the opposing arguments of what is falsely called knowledge. Timothy, stay out of philosophy. Don't, don't preach philosophy. Don't teach philosophy. Those things are falsely identified as what we would call knowledge. You stay out of the worldly things. Titus is told the same in Titus 3, 9, but avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and useless. You know, that was a large uh, period of time within the church when the church was an infant as Greeks and Jews fighting over all these things relating to Moses' law. And he said, don't get involved in that. That's pointless. It's a waste of time. And then he says this in verse 10, and this is very strong language. He said, reject the divisive man after the first and the second admonition. He said, admonish a divisive person. Do it once. If they don't repent, do it twice. And then if they do it again, reject them. You know what reject means? Pull away. We use the word withdraw. How important is it to God that the body is united? Important enough that he tells an evangelist, if people are being divisive, you admonish them once and then twice, and then you withdraw from them. Knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. We actually see this in application. There were some people that were being divisive there, and he makes his statement about Cretans and how their own writers said that Cretans are always liars. And he goes on to talk about these Cretans who are causing problems. And he said, this testimony is true. What people say about these Cretans is true. They are. They're liars. And, and he says, here's what you need to do. You need to go rebuke them sharply. 
that they may be sound in faith. You say, well, I thought the Bible said that we're supposed to speak with grace, season with salt. We are. This is not a generic commandment given to all God's people to find people that are, that are being divisive and rebuke them sharply. This is written to an evangelist. Rebuke them sharply. Correct them. Why? Because they need to be sound in the faith. 1 Timothy 3.14, These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. But if I'm delayed, I write so that you, Timothy, may know how you, Timothy, ought to obey, uh, ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. He says, I've written these things so you'll know what to do. So you know how to behave yourself in the midst of the, of, of, of the church. And he said, I might be delayed, so I'm writing these things so, so you'll know exactly what you need to be doing. And I want you to notice this right here. The church of the living God is what? The pillar and ground of the truth. The church is not meant for men's marketing schemes. It's not meant for that. It's not to make any one person rich. It's not to make any of us rich for that matter in a worldly sense. The church is not meant to be a social gathering of people who all believe in Jesus. It's meant to be a body of sanctified believers who all have one standard which is the truth of the Word of God. It is the pillar and the ground of the truth. And that's why it was so important that Timothy take a stand for truth and for unity without partiality. Now Timothy gets his own charge. Paul says, I charge you. I charge you. Before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge... <laughs> Now, that's not a generic statement either. You know what he's saying? Timothy, what I'm saying is important. And you need to recognize, I'm charging you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge. Who's he talking toward? Timothy. Understand, we will be judged by God, Timothy. So you preach the word. You be instant or ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort, with all long-suffering and teaching. What did he say? I'm charging you to preach the truth. And you convince. And you rebuke. I charge you to rebuke. I charge you to exhort. And you do that with patience and with teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. I remember there's a really good book that was written years ago. You might have read the book by Dale Carnegie. It's called How to Win Friends and Influence People. I'd say there's some tremendous tools about communicating with people and getting to know people and connect with people there, but I'm going to tell you something. The job of an evangelist is not to require as many friends as he can. That's not his job. Notice what he says. Sometimes you're going to say things that people don't want to hear. And they'll find other people to tell them what they want to hear. Because they've got itching ears. Because their desire is not according to the truth. So you preach the word and you convince and you rebuke and you exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Because people are going to turn away their ears from the truth. You know what that does? It makes you lose friends. It makes you lose friends. But that's the calling. The calling is not to build a following. It's not to build as many people that, who, who are on your team as possible. That's what we see with this televangelist deal. Why do you think it's so popular? Because they're telling people what they want to hear. That's not the job that God called an evangelist to in Scripture. He said, you're going to stand on the firing line, on the other side of the firing line, rather, and you're going to preach the truth. How do you preach the truth? How do you preach the truth? Again, we have this avoid foolish and ignorant disputes knowing that they do what? Generate strife or cause fighting. And here's what he says in verse 24. I look at this as a qualification for evangelists. He says, the servant of the Lord must not quarrel. Don't fight, Timothy. My, my job as an evangelist is not to debate. It's not. It's not to go out here and fight people. And I'll tell you, when we start fighting people, we've lost the mission. God didn't ask us to fight against people. He taught us to fight for them, to fight for their soul, not against them. He says, Timothy, don't be a fighter. Don't fight in that way. Don't quarrel with people, but be gentle to all. 
be able to teach. You know what able to teach means? It means skillful in teaching. It's the same qualification that's given to elders in 1 Timothy chapter 3. An evangelist must be skillful in teaching. And I'll tell you why. Because if you're not going to fight with people when they have opposing beliefs, you better be skillful. Because a lot of people aren't skillful, and I'll tell you what they do. They just think the loudest person in the debate wins. All you win is the fight, but you lose the war. You've got to be skillful as a teacher, patient. You know why? Because people need patience in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. If God peradventure will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Who are we warring against? Are we warring against people? No, we're warring against Satan and against Satan's ideology. And the word is what we use to wage that war. Lastly, an evangelist must practice what he preaches. I said lastly. I've got one more after this. This will be quick. An evangelist must practice what he preaches. Paul said of himself, I discipline my body. I discipline my body, and I bring it into subjection. That is, I tell my body what to do. I don't, my body doesn't tell me what to do. I tell my body what to do. Why? So when I preach to others, I don't become disqualified. You ever heard somebody say to their kids, I want you to do, what, uh, uh, do as I say, not as I do. Good luck with that. Good luck with that. Because our kids will do what we do, regardless of what we say. That's the same truth of preaching. That's true of elders. It's true of evangelists. It's true of teachers. If you try to bind heavy burdens on other people and you yourself are not willing to lift them, borrowing a phrase from Jesus, people will do what you do, not what you say. They'll say, well, he says that, but look at his standard. And so an evangelist preaches with his life as well. Let no one despise your youth. But be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Timothy was a young man and he says, don't let anybody despise your youth. You say, yeah, some people despise young people. That's not his point. Think about this. Timothy's going to all these churches and trying to set them in order. And what's the easiest out for people? You don't know what you're talking about. You're a young guy. You're a young man. I know how young, young Timothy was. But I do know this, he was young enough that Paul said, you need to be concerned about your youth getting in the way of your work. And so here's what you need to do. You live it. If you will be an example in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in impurity, people will follow you. But if you don't do those things, you know what they're going to do? He's just ignorant, foolish kid. I've seen it happen. I've lived it. <laughs> I've been the example of it. You must practice what you preach. Titus 2, 7. In all things, Titus, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing integrity. Live what you preach is what that means. Reverence. You know what that word reverence means? Honor. Be honorable. Incorruptibility. Sound speech that cannot be condemned that no one who is an opponent may be ashamed. Having nothing evil to say to you, this one is very important. You know why? Because this is the weapon that we're using most of the time is the mouth. And I, I don't always control my mouth. Do you always control your mouth? Sometimes we just shoot off at the mouth, don't we? So he says it's very important that you have sound speech that cannot be condemned. You know why? Because you have no credibility when you talk to someone in opposition if there's something you said that they can condemn you for. So you've got to be very careful with your words so that they don't have anything evil to say of you. Timothy is told this, but you, O man, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Fight the fight of faith, Timothy. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of of many witnesses. Pursue is a really strong word. You ever been pursued by someone? 
then you'll know that's a strong word. Timothy, pursue these things and fight. Fight the good fight of faith. If you're going to fight, you must be willing to suffer. This is a calling. He says, remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to the gospel, for which I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains, but the word of God is not chained. He said, Timothy, I am suffering trouble as an evildoer. People are looking at me like I'm a criminal, even to the point where I've been arrested. But he said, the word of God still has free course. It's not chained. Therefore, I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. And he says this, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. There's a cross that must be borne in carrying the message of God. And any of you who have done it know that's true, don't you? We go back in the Old Testament, you know what we see? Some strange language when it says, the burden of the word of the Lord to insert prophet. The burden of the word of the Lord. Why would he say the burden of the word of the Lord? Do you know what happened to those people? When they went out and they told people, repent, this is the will of God. They were killed. I've never felt like I was going to die. I've never felt that. Because we live in a place that even though things have changed a little bit here in our country, people aren't really so antagonistic toward Christians that people are being killed. But they were being killed. And he said, Timothy, you do it. It's worth it. And he reminds them why. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of the world or of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Now, some have looked at this and said, well, that that means that an evangelist can't have an outside job. That's not what he means when he says he doesn't entangle himself with the affairs of this life. Paul built tents during the week. He lived to the gospel, but he built tents. You know why? Because sometimes people need to work to provide for their family. That's not what that's talking about. What's it talking about? You stay focused on the war. And the war is not in Washington, D.C. It's not in Austin, Texas. It's not down here in the center of town. That's not the war. You don't get entangled with all that. That's a mess. You stay focused on the kingdom of God. Your general is Jesus Christ. He gave you your marching orders. He enlisted you as a soldier. And you must be willing to endure hardship to fight that fight. Every soldier that enlists, knows that they put themselves in danger. And so that's a calling of an evangelist is to endure hardship. And lastly, I want to look at 2 Corinthians eleven twenty-eight 28 as we close. If you're familiar with this chapter, you might remember that Paul is going through a list of things that he suffered. A list of terrible things that he suffered. Physical affliction, being in prison, uh, being shipwrecked. All these things. And he said, besides other things, what comes on me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. That hardship was probably greater for him than any other thing. Is knowing when he left Ephesus, what's going to happen to Ephesus? When he left Philippi, what's going to happen to Philippi? It wasn't a job. It was life. And he cared about those people. The people that he shared the most important thing with, which is the blood of Jesus Christ and the family of God. He cared about those people. And that was a daily hardship that he dealt with. But do you think he regretted that? Do you think Paul looked at his life and said, my life is not fair? I want to tell you, I ended here because this needs to be all of our concern. We ought to be concerned about us as individuals. We ought to be concerned about this congregation. But we ought to be concerned about what's going on overseas with our brethren who are being persecuted. 
We ought to be concerned about what's going on in Dumas, Texas and Amarillo, Texas and all these places where the Lord's church is. We've got to be concerned with one another because we're all a part of the same body. I hope there's been something that's helpful to you in understanding this particular role in the church. And um, Like I said, we covered a lot of ground, but this is not an exhaustive study on the work and role and authority of an evangelist. So if you've got questions or I miscommunicated something, please come visit with me later after church. And uh, if you want to study further on this, we'd love to do that as well. We never like to end without offering the invitation of Jesus Christ. If you're here today and you're having something in your heart that's heavy and you need to bring that to Jesus Christ, we encourage you to do that. And if you're not a Christian, if you're not a member of the body of Jesus Christ, we want to give you the opportunity to do that at this time. We have water prepared. We've got to change of clothes. If you want, know what you need to do to be saved and you want to be baptized into Jesus Christ today, we want to help you do that. So come have a seat on the front as we stand and we sing.